Hello and welcome to the WBK Ultra podcast. Busy day today, so I'm going to jump right into it with some retail arbitrage tips, kind of the, the news from the week in review. So the first thing is the Rick and Morty Pringles Rick, Pickle Rick, uh, Pringles cans. Those are trending upward towards $25. I, I post on Instagram on, uh, I don't know what it was, a few days ago, and I said they're trending towards $10. I think they may they may be sold out in a lot of places. Um, I have not been able to find them in my area, actually. Supposedly, they're at uh, Walmart and Target in the Midwest, and then over further out uh, in other parts of the country. I think mostly Southeast, Southwest, East Coast would be like H-E-B or HEB. I think it's called H-E-B. They have them there, too. Uh, you can also get them off Instacart if they have them in your area. On Instacart, they're $2.47, and then in store, they're like either a buck or a buck twenty-five. And they're going for between like 10 and 25 bucks. I saw them go for 25 on Mercari, uh, 10 bucks on eBay. I haven't checked other marketplaces on Amazon FBA. They have a two pack that when I checked on the last day I checked, they were at 20 bucks, um, so 10 bucks a piece. But there's no doubt in my mind that those have gone up because Rick and Morty stuff, it's really good to flip. Uh, I think a year ago even, or maybe it was, yeah, it was like a year and a half ago, I, I made a, a retail arbitrage video about some other limited edition stuff, maybe it was like eight months ago, and there was a Rick and Morty uh, mini board for like sound production, and that was being sold for I think 47 bucks, and it's going for like 300 right now, I went and checked it up again, it's like um, a, a synthesizer additional thing for hardware for a computer. Rick and Morty stuff sells really well, they have a rabid fan base, and their fans are usually a, a, a bit younger, I think, and so they have more, um, they're, they're okay buying Pringles cans for 20 bucks. Maybe it's for a photo shoot. Who knows? I don't know. If you remember over Thanksgiving, they did a special, uh, like, Thanksgiving flavor. Those did really well, too, retail arbitrage-wise. They kind of dropped off, like, a month afterwards, so I'm guessing um, maybe these will last a bit longer, and when I say last longer, I mean the time we can sell them for is going to last longer because they're not seasonal like Thanksgiving chips would be. They're just Pickle Rick, and that's like a, a beloved character. So obviously, um, they're going to expire eventually. I'd say if you're going to FBA these, you want to make sure that they have at least six months shelf life left on them. I don't know what Pringles cans typically are, but I'd guess at least a year. So you should be fine for now. Um, we didn't really see any like huge devaluation by the market flooding. So that's really good. But also, it again makes me think that they were doing really isolated um, incidents of inventory placement in these stores, these Walmarts or HEBs or wherever they are. Again, I couldn't find them in my area. Um, I'm in Ann Arbor and I checked Walmart, I checked Kroger, I checked Target, and none of those had them. And I couldn't even find like the little placard um, on the wall that says like, that says like what, what product's there. I went to the Pringles section, nothing. So maybe they're not even being sold in all regions. Uh, the next thing is Game Boy Colors. So about three days ago, this guy who's, uh, it's called like the Odd Tinkerer, he made a viral video on YouTube about how to uh, fix up and upgrade Game Boy Colors. He bought one for two bucks on eBay, uh, and so he's been sending his followers in droves to eBay. And if you watch like a Fat Man Flipper, he sold a Game Boy Color in teal for like 50 bucks in like 15 seconds, like right away. So they're really going up for a lot higher than they used to go for. Um, it obviously depends on if you have the right buyer because a lot of these viewers are not necessarily going to be looking for the best price, but they are going to want a specific model. So I would say there's a, a higher premium on the specific colors. Uh, I've seen the Tommy Hilfiger yellow Game Boy color go for like 80 bucks, and that's up from what it used to go for as well on eBay. And of course on Mercari, um, on Etsy, on those places, they're gonna be, there's going to be a slight premium as well, but mostly we're seeing these move on eBay, and again, that was because of a, a video from um, the Odd Tinkerer, and they're they're trending really hard right now. So if you have, I have, um, I have a little cache of Game Boys over there. I haven't listed. I'm gonna list those all today, and uh, hopefully, I can post the, the the sales record tonight on my Instagram. My Instagram is at wbk Knobloch, So is my Twitter. Follow me on there if you want to talk about retail arbitrage stuff or online arbitrage stuff. Uh, also, I want to talk about the N95 masks. This is kind of an interesting thing. Um, if you want to, you know, take a step back from your own uh, ethical or moral observations and purely seeing it as like, okay, here's what's happening. Uh, places like Amazon are actually trying to cut back on price gouging and they're trying to make it more obvious to consumers that these N95 masks you can get at Home Depot or uh, wherever you're buying them, Lowe's, 
Um, they're not necessarily going to be guaranteed against viruses or molecules. They're, they're mostly for like particulate um, uh, blocking things out, particulate uh, respiration avoidance, <laughs> I guess would be the long way of saying it. And so if you've been watching the ratings for these products, they've been getting kind of like two and a half, three star ratings, which is not good. And is uh, on Amazon and eBay is really going to hurt their um, the uh, the search prevalence. How, how often they show up when someone types in like coronavirus. First of all, you can't even have that in your title on Amazon because they're saying like, no, that's it's not for that. And on eBay as well, they send out emails and that kind of stuff. And secondly, if customers are actually reading the reviews, uh, you're going to have less of a demand. So even though I've, I've checked, you know, all my lows, all my Home Depot's, you can go on the apps and see where they are. Like in the state of Michigan, there's not a single N95 mask for sale at Lowe's or Home Depot. I don't know if they're on back order. Uh, the issue with a lot of these masks is they are made in the United States, but from overseas parts. And if they're from China, first of all, the issues that we all know about. But second of all, it's like Chinese New Year's coming up. So beyond the strain from uh, physical illness and the fear of that, there's also going to be issues with just less folks are working, there's less shipments, and so it could be until like May or, or who knows when, um, when there's the next restock for these. But I think what's gonna happen probably is if there is not a restock for a long time, people on Amazon and eBay are not gonna be allowed to sell them for like 500 bucks. And not because it's gonna be illegal necessarily. I'm not sure if you could say that uh, you can price gouge for a product that doesn't actually do its job. You know, if they're not being marketed as um, for the coronavirus, if they're just being marketed as like painting respirators, is that price gouging? I don't know. Again, that's like for lawmakers to decide. But I think even beyond that, it doesn't help Amazon or eBay's business to be a, a haven for this sort of like gross um, inflation. So my tip is if you have them, sell them now. I think that like we're in the sweet spot now where like it isn't a huge world crisis, but it's still like getting worse and worse. So there's a uh, higher than normal demand, but there's not these restrictions being put in place by places like eBay or state government or whatever it is. So interesting thing to watch. Um, obviously, a lot of you have opinions on that, the ethics, the morality. I'd say leave that off the comments because, you know, it's just your opinion. And if you want to talk about that with your friends, uh, do that. But we can't really see your faces here. So there's going to be a lot of room for misinterpretation. The third thing, or sorry, the fourth thing is, are we gonna be selling discounted Valentine's Day candy? And the answer is maybe. I went to Walmart today, I looked up a lot of the stuff on uh, on Profit Bandit looking at Amazon, looking at the prices, and a lot of these things are being sold at a profit. It's like a 60% profit usually. So like um, what I saw specifically being sold at that profit was the gimmick candy. Like there's these ring pops that leave like a tattoo on your tongue. Those are going for uh, like 25 bucks and they're being sold for like $10 and then after the fees you're getting like $6 profit. Um, are those gonna be valuable? No, and then yes. So when we're doing retail arbitrage, we have to be very, very patient. This is the kind of thing that I've been trying to think about this week is taking a step back from all the chaos occurring around us, whether it be in your personal life, whether it be just thoughts in your head, or whether it be a market of, of, of discounted uh, Valentine's Day candy. You don't wanna get caught up in these emotions, in this fear, in overconfidence, and whatever it is, you wanna take a step back and analyze what's going on rationally and with a clear mind. And so when we do that, we kinda of say, okay, what's gonna happen is tomorrow, February 15th, we're gonna see massive markdowns on Halloween candy. <laughs> if they still had it. On Valentine's Day candy, I mean. Um, Halloween candy's in the dumpster at this time of the year. So we're gonna see massive markdowns, and then everyone's gonna flock to these stores, buy it all up, and then list it. And they're going to be caught up in the pandemonium around them, uh, and they're gonna see prices that go up and then go down. And they're gonna get scared of the prices going down, so they're gonna lower their prices. And there's going to be this dip, kind of like a reverse, you know, a reverse peak would be a trough. There's going to be a trough in prices. And then once all those people who are scared or just trying to make a quick buck or whatever it is, lose their inventory, the people who actually want the candy or want to buy it for next year or whatever it is, then they're going to be paying a higher price. So with that being said, what kind of stuff gets sold for a higher price? It isn't just like Tootsie Rolls because, okay, if they're in a little heart-shaped package 
or a brown package, there's still Tootsie Rolls. I mean, that there's gonna be a slight increase because of just a, a limited supply, but what's really gonna go up in price and what's really gonna have value past this initial trough of everyone flooding the market is gonna be the gimmick candy. Like I said, the tongue tattoo one or whatever it is. So look out for those, be patient, let the dust settle. And as long as you have like a year or two uh, shelf life on the candy, which oftentimes these, uh, these candies, there's hard candies, what they mostly are is like sugar and water, and that's not really gonna expire that often, so they might have a longer shelf life. You could uh, actually, I remember I did this, hmm, at this point, seven years ago, but I bought a bunch of chocolate roses for a nickel <laughs> at CVS's, and then sold them throughout the year, because even though chocolate has a, a lower shelf life, um, it stills like eight or 10 months usually, and that's gonna be in the bottom of the package. The fifth thing I wanna talk about is online arbitrage for sports cards. So I've been following this market a lot recently. I've been following uh, a lot of uh, prolific flippers of sports cards. I've been tracking the searches on eBay. I've been signing up for newsletters from um, the companies who do this. I don't wanna say what their names are yet because I'm not totally sure about what the good ones are or the bad ones are, so I don't wanna put out false information. But what I am noticing is a lot of these boxes of cards there are two types of cards. There's like retail cards and there's hobby cards. The hobby cards are the ones that are worth a lot of money potentially. And those are the boxes you buy for like 150 from uh, the manufacturer. And they're being flipped on eBay for like five, 600 bucks because everyone wants to get Zion Williamson cards. Everyone wants to get, um, you know, Patrick Mahomes cards, but he, he was a rookie two years ago. So that isn't a good example. But whoever uh, the rookie of the year was in the NFL last year, maybe not him, but like a Lamar Jackson card from two years ago. Um, I can't off the top of my head think of who the best rookie was last year, but uh, whoever it was, people also want those cards and they are buying the packs to do on breakings on YouTube. There's a whole community and a whole world behind, um, behind football cards. I used to collect football cards when I was younger, when I was like eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. And what I think's happening is people who are about 10 years, maybe 20 years older than me are retiring. They're getting into this point in their life where they want to collect things. They want to, you know, have more hobbies, do more things for fun. And um, well, they're buying them on eBay and that presents an opportunity for people like us to go, uh, to go flip them. So again, I don't know exactly how to propose to do this yet. Um, obviously go on, on eBay and look up what's selling and make your own lists. But hopefully in a week or two, I can have a video for you that kind of explains how to do these cards uh, in more detail. On to some eBay news. So this is the time of year when if you have any retail arbitrage finds of like uh, winter clothing gear, I would say begin to mark it down now. The end of spring break kind of marks the last final hurrah for online sales of like winter gear boots, coats, that kind of stuff. Obviously, if it's a lighter jacket or if it's a really in-demand product, you're gonna have sales all through the summer. But for the most part, we're gonna see a downward trend in uh, winter gear sales. So keep in mind, do that. I still have, I think, three or four pairs of boots from my last Dick's Sporting Good um, retail arbitrage haul. I bought a bunch of pairs of boots for like five or 10 bucks and some golf shoes too. The golf shoes I just listed a bit ago because I'm planning on those being sold over the summer or spring months. But the boots, um, what happens is, is the for me, what happened was, is the adult boots sold and the kids boots are not selling. So I think what I might even do is just take them to a local auction because at this point I have them down to like 60 bucks and I don't wanna you know, only make $15 if I have to ship them. And then there's the, the, the risk of returns because if someone's buying a, a children's pair of boots at this time in the year, probably they're gonna grow out of them by next winter and they might regret the purchase, I don't know. So there's a local auction house. I think I'll take them too, and I should get a decent value for them. Uh, people at the local auction there, they're more concerned about how much of a, of a deal it is in relation to the retail price. And this isn't universal, but just specific to my local auction house, it's liquid bidding. Shout out to the Rusk brothers. They don't watch this, but they own it. <laughs> they, they own it. Um, and that's where I'll be taking my stuff. Next segment, what I'm looking for on eBay. So I'm getting back into eBay again. I'm not really doing clothes. The only clothes I'm doing uh, are gonna be like outdoor gear, coats, hunting stuff, camo stuff, things like this shirt right here. This is a LL Bean uh, 2XL tall, like fleece lined flannel shirt. Yeah, I'd buy that because I know these are gonna be selling year round because it's kind of a unique thing to get. Um, not so much like, 
here's a cool vintage t-shirt here's a cool this although i will pick those up um it's more just like hey do i like this thing do i know it's gonna sell but beyond that i'm trying to get more into art more into uh pottery more into the kind of things that i can get for like two bucks because they're being passed over uh, with the the advent of so many people getting their information like you guys are from this video uh, There are a lot of more people in the thrift stores I've noticed going after the low hanging fruit meaning the uh, the stuff that's easiest to find so They're going scanning video games. They're going looking for VCRs that kind of stuff And what they don't have the ability to do what they haven't done yet is uh, They haven't learned about these figurines this art this kind of stuff. So even today. I picked up a little tile uh, it's called The Raven. The artist is Joe Wilson. He's a First Nation artist from Canada. Uh, First Nation is what they call Native Americans, indigenous people, whatever you want to call it. The, the folks who walked over the Bering Strait, you know, arguably 20,000 years ago, depending on your uh, what timeline you agree by. But that's a whole different video. So an artist from that lineage makes paints these tiles with very interesting um, tribal designs. The one I got was called the Raven. I paid a buck fifty for it. It'll sell for forty bucks, and it should sell pretty fast. So I'm getting more into that stuff, more of the things that require uh, an eye, and less that require like the actual looking up. Uh, I I think if you can differentiate yourself from other sellers by the knowledge you have, as opposed to how often you're willing to work, as opposed to how often you are willing to go in and scan barcodes, you're going to have an easier time optimizing your thrift store runs because you're not trying to get more time in the store, you're trying to get better time in the store. In addition to that kind of stuff, we're also just going for summer gear stuff, so golf clubs, uh, hiking gear, camping stuff, tents, but that's pretty basic normal stuff. You can sell golf stuff pretty much year round, but in Michigan at least, I'm finding more golf stuff now this time of year. Uh, and over the summer, it's almost essentially impossible to find because the guys who come in at 9 a.m. buy it all up, and they sell it locally, they take it to a play, play it against sports or whatever it is, which isn't, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just saying the way I source, I don't usually go to all my stores at 9 a.m. I'm usually doing like, well, I'll go to one store, but I'm not, I'm not trying to be the first person through the doors. I've been thinking about a lot of stuff this week too. Uh, in addition to the retail arbitrage stuff, in addition to eBay stuff, in addition to Amazon stuff, I've been trying to really be a lot more present in my thoughts. Uh, I've been thinking about this idea of clear, thoughts of like I said with the retail arbitrage with the chaos of the environment uh, with, the, with the Pringles uh, pickle Rick chips or with whatever there is sometimes it's very easy to get caught up in your emotions because of things you're seeing on around you you see uh, trends and prices you see people making a bunch of money doing this you see someone losing money doing that and it's kind of scary or if not scary it just it kind of jumbles your mind and so I've been trying to think about taking a step back from that and actually focusing on what's happening around me. I watched a bunch of videos about this guy named um, Vim Kiff or something like that. He's a Scandinavian dude uh, from Norway or wherever he is who takes these baths in freezing cold water. He's been doing it for years and years and years. And I've been kind of trying to do that myself because uh, when I go out into the cold and I have to actually focus on how I feel it makes me more aware of like what's actually going on around me. It uh, allows me to take a step back from whatever my thoughts are. You know, maybe the the chaos going on between my ears, and I have to actually focus on like the physical world, the things that actually exist, not my premonitions, not my anxieties about, <laughs> you know, name the list uh, or list things off, but just about okay. Here's my body. You know, I can feel the blood. Uh, seeping away from the ends of my fingertips. I can feel my core, you know, being being engorged with more blood. Uh, I, I can feel my body shivering to stay warm. Just things like that kind of takes you out of whatever uh, mental booby trap you've made for yourself and allows you to kind of focus on these more uh, basal aspects of your human body. And I think that if you're someone who believes that everything comes from the body, that we live in a physical world, that we live in a world uh, where things are real and can be experienced and can be touched, you kind of have to use uh, your physical sensations and your physical perceptions as the foundation for any uh, sort of, sort of self-betterment you do. I've also been thinking about uh, the idea of when to respond and when not to respond. So last week I was thinking about um, this idea of replacing hate with curiosity. And so I responded to everyone that I could who I was upset at with this curiosity. 
uh, why are you saying this? And here's the good news. So I did convert a lot more people who didn't like me in the comments to people who did like me. And not because I'm trying to get them to like me, but because if they do like me, and I'm using this as kind of just a general term for having having a, a pleasant attitude towards me, being receptive of the things I say, being open to a conversation, because just saying someone likes you is very, it sounds vapid. Uh, and I'm not trying to trying to convey that. I'm saying they're more uh, receptive towards me. They don't see me as a threat, I suppose, or someone who's gonna make fun of them, but not for everyone. Uh, if sometimes someone was trying to be rude to me, uh, I would ask them a question and the question may uh, have embarrassed them or may have been perceived as being condescending or whatever it is. And so in some cases, if someone's obviously just trying to get your goat, get your goad, <laughs> one, of the, one of the two, trying to get your G word, <laughs> um, maybe you shouldn't respond. And that isn't to say the only things you shouldn't respond to are people trying to bother you. Sometimes there could be someone that you care about a lot who says something that um, maybe they're in a bad mood or maybe they're bored and they just want to talk about something and they want to, you know, use a little bit of conflict to, to get the conversation going. Sometimes it's best to ignore that too. Um, liking someone, someone, you know, and again, uh, a very superficial, shallow term, but someone in your family, your, your girlfriend, your best friend, uh, a coworker you respect, they're not always gonna be the ideal person 100% of the time. And to expect that from them, uh, not only puts an unfair burden on them, but also puts unfair expectations for how others act on yourself. And if they don't meet them, then there's uh, all sorts of unnecessary uh, questions going on that are just, you know, it's kind of like um, shrapnel or, or shotgun fire. So sometimes there are times you shouldn't respond. And how to not re how can one not respond without being rude? I don't know yet. I mean, you tell me if if you want to ignore someone but be but not make it seem as if they're beneath you, what do you say? What I've been trying to say is I'll take that into consideration because I will. That that's the truth. I had someone at the gym the other day correct my form incorrectly. <laughs> they didn't know what I was doing. They thought I was trying to do a different lift than I was, and they were, they were, it was pretty obvious to me that they had just done their, uh, their workout. It was a new workout for them. They were psyched and they wanted to just like share the information that they had obtained with me. And so they gave me advice that was bad advice. And I don't like either of those things. And so instead of saying like, why are you telling me this? Like, who are you? Instead of, instead of trying to get to the, the, uh, an understanding of why they're talking. I said, oh yeah, I, I'll think about that. Like, thank you. Because what I tried to focus on was, okay, this person was trying to help me. It was misguided, it was rude, it was impersonal, it was condescending, but they, their intention was to help me. And so by ignoring what actually occurred, because they weren't trying to do that, I was able to be more neutral towards it um, and, and respond that way. So, you know, think about that. Maybe it doesn't work for you, but for me, as someone who's very uh, volatile at times, who's very reactive to things, who takes what people say um, and responds to it because that's just the way I'm wired, sometimes it's better to dewire that, that, that demand you feel for a response because what that really is, is it's saying that like, oh, I owe you this. And really, do you owe people a response? I don't know you know, something to think about during the next week. I've also been trying to work out more, be healthier. I think what I might start doing is I might start trying to get up earlier and work out in the morning. Currently, I'm working out three days a week and all I'm really doing is like deadlift, bench press, biceps, shoulders, maybe like another leg lift, uh, a leg workout. I'm not really into like uh, a, a full octane workout yet where I'm going like five days a week, but I have gone from like one day a week to three days a week and it's every week, not like, oh, I'll miss a week here, I'll miss a week there. And that's been really good for me. Um, over the past few days, I've not felt very good, but I've still been able to go work out. I've still been able to, you know, like clean my house. I've still been able to clean my warehouse, things like that. And uh, I don't think I could have done that a month ago or two months ago. It's just been this acknowledgement that whatever I'm feeling is not necessarily what I should be paying attention to. Uh, I'm acknowledging these these depressive feelings. I'm acknowledging this this sense of lethargy, this sense of hopelessness, and I'm saying, you know what? It's not worth it. It's not worth paying attention to. 
because it doesn't give me what I want. It might be easier, it might seem more convenient, but to just lay in bed and lament or to um, just focus on working hard and not, not have the self-awareness to take a step back and analyze where that work is going, I think has been immensely helpful. So if you're someone who, who deals with depression or, or whatever you want to call it, because really when I say depression, I'm not trying to speak in, in, in a clinical sense because I know that it's, it's relatively subjective. You know, it's the kind of thing you, you, you diagnose by the symptoms. And so what we're talking about nor is, uh, more is this melange of, uh, of, of symptoms, of feelings. And um, whatever, if you have any of them, I think you can use this advice and use the, these, uh, this way of perceiving the world around you to help them pass through you. You know, I, I, I can't make myself not have these thoughts. It's not possible. They're there. The same way I can't make myself stop breathing, I can't make my mind stop thinking. And so to acknowledge them and just let them float through me and, and be on their way back into the universe, <laughs> that's, that's what's worked for me. Um, it hasn't made the days easier, but it's made them more productive. And so I can look back on my week and say, you know what, Blake, even though you had a shitty time and you were struggling, you still got the things you intended to do done. And so it wasn't a failure. You just had a bad week. Hope this is helpful, guys. Hope you like the format. I'm trying to tighten it up, trying to make it more applicable to business, to resale, just to to kind of make it, to contextualize it for you guys. So I'm not just being abstract and verbose, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm actually helping. Don't be a shithead and uh, I'll see you later.